Good evening and welcome. This is our final Pathways to Purpose event of the fall semester. Um, I really hope that you guys enjoy tonight's program and that you enjoy it so much that you will come and spend some time with us spring semester as well. We have a phenomenal lineup of men and women who we are bringing to campus next semester. Rather than list them all for you here right now, there are calendars set up in the back, and so I encourage you to go take a look. We have people talking about um, moving from corporate communications to organizing, moving from uh, working in the correction system to now being a counselor, uh, somebody who was an accounting major here at Valpo who decided that she wanted to use her accounting skills for good and now works at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. So we really encourage you to check out the folks that we're bringing and hopefully you can join us for at least a couple of those events next semester. Um, so the event tonight is redeployment, finding meaning after armed service. Um, we have so many different events that help our students make sense of kind of their calling in the world and how the events that have shaped you prior to coming to Valparaiso University, while here at Valparaiso University, off campus, on campus, um, we know that we are formed by the experiences that we have, and I think that one of the things that we want to recognize tonight are the ways that military service are, the, it is this really intense experience that does shape the way that you view the world and your place in it. And so we are very excited to be able to offer for you tonight a variety of stories to help you kind of think more deeply about your own sense of calling and the things that have formed you in the ways that you think about the world. Um, so by way of introduction. Uh, I am Thais Carter. I am the director of the Institute for Leadership and Service. If you have any questions after tonight's program, you can come find myself or my colleague, Allie DeVries, who's in the back. Um, I'd like to invite our panelists to come sit up here, and then I will introduce you all one at a time. I'm going to give just a very brief intro for everyone and then we're going to allow everybody the opportunity to tell a little bit of their own story in more detail. Uh, but starting immediately to my left, we have Dr. Jason Gerke. He is part of the 2018-2020 cohort of the Valparaiso University-based Lilly Fellows Program in Humanities and the Arts focused on religious studies. In 2010, three years after he completed his master's degree, Dr. Gerke joined the Army Reserve. In 2013, he was awarded the Bronze Star for his service, providing direct support to combat operations in Afghanistan. In 2016, he was awarded the General Douglas MacArthur Leadership Award. Next to him, we have Mayosha Thomas. She is the founder of One Savvy Veteran. She served 10 years active duty in the United States Navy before she was honorably discharged and medically retired from military service due to her extensive injuries, and then sent home in 2010. When she returned home, she found it difficult to find a place that had all the information that she needed to help her transition from military service to civilian life, and she noticed that as few services as there were for veterans, there were even fewer for women veterans. So she decided to create an organization that encouraged, educated, and empowered women veterans, helping them successfully navigate from military service to civilian life. Next to her, we have Dr. Makiba Butler, who is the Associate Director of Veteran Programs at the Women's Business Development Center, working with veterans, active military, reserve, guard, and military spouses in providing education, information, and resources to operate as a successful business owner. An Air Force veteran, she combined her military training and educational experience with the love that she had for business and successfully launched an educational, educational services company where she managed 30 tutor consultants and generated $150,000 in part-time revenue within the first four years. She's also provided business consulting to startup and existing businesses in the educational sector for many years. Next to her, Mike Espinda honorably served as a member of the Indiana Army National Guard for over 27 years of service, including 26 years on active duty. He retired at the rank of Sergeant Major in 2013. He served two tours overseas in support of Operation Desert Spring in 2001 and 2002, and Operation Iraqi Freedom from 2009 to 2010. He's a disabled veteran and enjoys serving those who have served alongside him and fought for our country's freedom. As the training and recruiting manager for Central Indiana at Operation Job Ready Veterans, his primary focus is recruitment, coordination, and the instructor for the Veteran Employment Transition Seminar, VETS, in Indianapolis and the surrounding regions. So join me once again in a round of applause for our panelists. All right, so I'd like to start with each of you uh, sharing a bit of your story, and specifically kind of how about your decision to serve and where you've been. Oh, 
<laughs> One of you is going to have to. Well, can you hear me? Well, uh, thank you, um, Thais, for inviting us, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I guess I can start. So, um, my uh, journey into the military um, uh, was unconventional. Um, I I was in a, a kind of recruiting program in college, uh, and I thought that I would join right after college, but then I didn't, um, for a number of reasons that had to do with sort of life at the time. Um, after I completed a master's degree, I found myself teaching in high school in Colorado Springs. Can you hear me? Is this coming through? Okay. I found myself teaching high school in Colorado Springs, and there uh, I had quite a few students whose parents were in the military because Fort Carson is an army post that's right outside of Colorado. Um, I was teaching uh, seventh, eighth through tenth grade, um, and I had a lot of students whose parents had been gone a lot because they had deployed multiple times. Um, and my it was really at that time that my original um, sense for for wanting to serve, participate in this larger thing that was happening uh, in the world, um, really kind of came to a head. So um, I joined the army in 2010. Um, and left for basic training um, eight days before my daughter's first birthday. Uh, I spent um, 10 months gone, um, and then at the end of that training in August of 2011, I began my academic graduate school career, uh, and then uh, deployed, I got orders for deployment, and then deployed in 12 and 13, uh, and so my graduate and then my academic professional life has sort of existed in parallel with my, with my military career um, for the last, how long it's been now, eight, eight years, a little more. Um, so I would say about the decision that for me it was in part a desire to be part of and, and to have a, an experience of participation in um, sort of these major operations that I see as sort of defining for our historical moment. Um, I didn't want to have sat out. Um, and also a desire to, to participate in um, and fill up some of the work that I saw studying my students' parents in their lives uh, experiencing when I was a teacher. So um, I could say more, but I'll, I'll stop there for now and uh, maybe we'll come back around. Hi. Um, that was a very patriotic reason. Mine was more um, I needed money for college. Um, I grew up in Inglewood in Chicago, from Chicago. Uh, Inglewood is not the best neighborhood. Um, single mom who's a teacher, I watched her pay um, student loans. Uh, she has a PhD, so she's still paying student, student loans. Um, and I knew I didn't want that life. Um, I always went to the best schools. Michelle Obama went to my high school, but way before me. Um, but the problem with going to a good school is that it's so competitive. So scholarships were not coming in, and I wanted to be a doctor, a trauma surgeon, because there used to be a show called ER, and I wanted to do that. Um, so while I'm researching scholarships, my friend was going to join the military, and she was nervous, and she wanted someone to go with her for support. So I went to the recruiting office with her, and I sat in a chair looking through scholarship books. Um, and she wound up being overweight, so they wouldn't take her. So as she was leaving upset, I'm trying to comfort her, like, oh, poor fat friend. Um, the recruiter looked at me and was like, well, what about you? I'm like, what about me? Everybody in my family, you know, it's, they go to high school, they go to college, they get jobs. That's the trajectory that I'm going to do. Um, and so the recruiter said, we can pay for school. And I was like, really? Um, I took the test. I've always been a good student. I scored extremely high, which got me into military intelligence, um, top secret stuff, and that was my job. Um, and I joined at 17 because they offered me money to come in um, early. So my mom actually had to sign up for her only child who happened to be female, which was not an easy task for my recruiter. Um, and I actually had to graduate high school early um, because I had to leave in May. Uh, and graduation was in June in high school. Um, so I was in boot camp for prom and graduation, regretting every decision. <laughs> Could have been in a pretty dress and I was in the dirt. But um, it was, 
I joined in 2000 before 9-11 happened, like a couple of months before 9-11 happened. So I don't know if 9-11 had happened that I would have joined knowing we were being war. so I always commend those who did that. Uh, but I did make the decision to re-up. Um, it, it was at first just for money to go to school to become a doctor. Um, and then I re-enlisted because I believe um, in the mission and what we were doing. I've been all over Europe, um, never been to Asia, but all over Europe, um, and mainly the East Coast, um, and then got hurt, came home. Good evening, everyone. My name is Makiba Butler, and I am an Air Force veteran. Yay, if you decide to go, or anyone knows, that's the best one to go to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Army always has some shade, because always, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so just a little bit about my military experience. Um, <clears throat> similar to what my colleague has said, um, but there are some dissimilarities there. So I will say I uh, enlisted in the Air Force when I was 19. I graduated from high school when I was 17. Um, never really had a desire to go to the military, so my military enlisting experience was very major. Um, it was, I had gone away to college, or not gone away, I went to college for a couple of years and just was not, um, always been, a great student, but just wasn't focused enough to be able to produce um, academically. I don't know what the problem was to this day. I still don't know what the problem was. Um, but decided um, at, at the very spur of the moment to go to the recruiter, and I was going to talk to the Army recruiter. I was going to talk to the Army recruiter, um, but he wasn't there. And so you, if we all know recruiters, we know that recruiters are, they are hungry, and they are savages when it comes to trying to get those numbers. So I went to the Army recruiter, <clears throat> had an appointment for the Army recruiter, and for some reason, he wasn't there. So I always say that my military experience was divine. Um, where I was supposed to go, I ended up going. Um, we had an appointment with the Army recruiter, he wasn't there, so I was going to turn around to go back to my car, and I was gonna come back later, and the Air Force recruiter stopped me and said, are you here for an appointment with the Army recruiter? And I said, yes, but he's not here. He said, well, come talk to me for a minute. And I didn't realize what he was doing at the time, but what he was doing was trying to get me. And he ended up getting me, and we talked. He, he gave me a wonderful um, spill on the Air Force and you know, had me believing everything that I needed to believe to um, enlist with the Air Force. And so I decided to do that without having a conversation with my mother. I too am an only child. Um, so I didn't, we can imagine how that conversation went over once I did tell her that I, that I signed up to go to the Air Force and I need to go to MEPS on this particular day, which was probably a month later. And she just looked at me like, are you serious? My father was an Army veteran, um, so if, if, if I were to go anywhere, it just would have been assumed that I would go to the Army and continue that family tradition, but I, and I tried. Um, but, uh, so I stayed in the Air Force for um, about four years and had every intention of, of staying in for a career, um, as a career, but I, um, in experienced some medical issues and so um, decided to get out. But while I was in there, I was in mostly a male-dominated MOS. Um, and that was something that was a little difficult for me to uh, eventually um, acquiesce to and just be able to do what I needed to do. And so that, was also, that also played a part into why I decided to get out. Um, fast forward several, several years. That was 1993. Um, it is now 2018. So fast forward, fast forward several years, I recently relocated to Chicago. So I live in the Chicago area and was given the opportunity to um, do some work with veterans. And so when I got that opportunity, I will admit I was so far removed from the veteran space because I had only served for a small amount of time and because there's not a lot of emphasis that's placed on veterans who serve for a small amount of time, you're not really considered military when you haven't put in the work, or if you haven't been to combat, or if you haven't done the things that really require you to be acknowledged as a veteran. Um, so I kind of stayed away. I, a lot of my friends that I served with have been in there and they retired. Um, but when I got to Chicago and got in the veteran space, so much that I'm learning that's available, so much that I'm learning that's attached to uh, my veteran experience and, and things that I share when I'm working with veterans now in the entrepreneurial space. So I think that 
um, there's a lot of information that, that is available to veterans and just helping them navigate through that process. So I'm excited to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Good evening, everybody. I'm from a military family. My grandfather, my uncle, my dad all served in the, in the Army, actually the best service that's out there, oh. and the largest. <laughs> um, I actually, I was born in Germany, I was an Army brat, born in Germany, moved back to Indiana when I was two, after my dad got out of Vietnam in 1968. I enlisted in the, in the Army on my 18th birthday as a senior in high school, and it was encouraged that I go in the military, actually my brother went in the military as well. And both my boys have served in the military. They're both out now. Um, so I swore in when I was 18, not thinking I would have to make a career out of it. So I signed up to be a helicopter mechanic. So I worked on helicopters for a while. Then I transitioned into logistics, and into supply, those sorts of things. Then I went into some admin fields as I grew up through the military. And then 20, almost 28 years later, I retired five years ago. So I had no idea I was going to make a career out of my military service or even retire. Um, and, it, and so, I too have been a lot of places around the world. Um, my last position was where I was in operations management. So I've done experiences in operations, I've done experiences in logistics, I've done experiences in admin, I've had some experiences in the IT field. So I'm not an Army recruiter, I'm not trying to tell you to join the service, but I just encourage you to look into it. There are so many opportunities out there for you guys to experience to get in the military about leadership, about uh, attention to detail, about taking care of yourself that you may not be getting at home, that you may be getting at home and if you do that's great, but you're going to learn so much from other people. Us four up here, obviously we're all veterans and there's probably some veteran families out there, people that are part of the veteran family. You learn things, you have a common bond because we're all veterans and so we can share our stories and share our experiences and help each other kind of what she's talking about. So now I work for a nonprofit organization that helps military families, service members, veterans with transition. Take all those experiences they've learned in the military and transition those into civilian terms where they can go out and get a good civilian job based on some of the experiences they think that they have in the military. So we have some specific questions for each of you, but before we get into <coughs> those, just kind of another general one for the panel, um, all of you is how would you say, I mean, now on a day-to-day -day basis, in what ways do, do your experiences serving impact the work that you're doing now in your civilian life? Whether that's through things that you perhaps pay more attention to than someone else, the ways that you choose to um, manage people who are under you or work with people who are your colleagues. Um, what are the ways that your service impacts your civilian work today? Um, for me, um, it's definitely my attention to detail, and I'm also able to work with a diverse group. Um, like, literally, I don't have to like you <laughs> um, to work with you, and like, we do a good job together. Like, um, there's a difference between a leader and a boss. Um, I can inspire people um, to want to work with me. Um, I can. Um, in the military, there's this thing of sort of praise in public and reprimand in private. Um, I do that that most people don't, um, that I've worked around don't do. Um, as far as attention to detail, I was sharing a story um, with the panel earlier that maybe I have too much attention to detail <laughs> that um, I, most people call on me to look, I can look at a situation and tell you how to do it more effectively, right? I have learned that civilians tend, the way I talk isn't always as sugary or as sweet, because I still have that military tone, um, but my message is always, you know, positive and clear and effect. It's all about effectiveness to get the job done. Um, I was sharing a story, this is probably how my attention to detail was too high. Um, I was at like a McDonald's drive through and they forgot my fries. And I went in and like, I need to speak to the manager. And like, yes, I'm like, you forgot my fries. Like, you had one job and you forgot my fries. And it was like this big thing. And they're like, whoa, here's two fries. <laughs> like, you can just go away. But, you know, it's like, it's 
it's that important in the military that what we consider, or what some civilians may consider are the small things, it's that important. Like those are people's lives, those are people, um, million dollar pieces of equipment, that's top secret information. So I tend to be very serious and protective uh, about operations and the way things flow and that every, every piece is put together nicely and almost perfectly. Maybe it's a borderline OCD and attention to detail. Um, but that has helped me. That's, most people look uh, to me for that. Like project management, that's pretty much I do all the time. I would say for me, uh, a couple of things. One of them, she already mentioned, is diversity. You know, diversity is huge nowadays. Just look at the diversity that's in this room right here. Okay. Another thing is, is that organizational skills. I really learned organizational skills in the military. You got to get, this is where you're at. You got to get to this location. What are you going to do to get there? You have, there's certain steps you have to do. It talks about procedures. You follow procedures. Almost everything in the military has a book on tell you how to do things. So you're going, to, you're going to do a lot of research, just like you do in school. When I was a helicopter mechanic, there were certain things that you have to do in a certain way, you know, because you have people's lives at stake. You have a flat tire, you can fall over on the side of the road. If an engine quits on a helicopter, or a rotor blade falls off, or whatever, something happens, you're probably going to die. You're going to crash. You know, so attention to detail in the aviation field is very, very, very important. And today, I, I follow through with those, it's those little things that she's talking about. Yeah, you may go to the drive-thru and you want extra pickles, you don't get any, you're probably gonna be mad, okay? I know I am, I would be, because that's something that was taught to me, ingrained in me the last 20 some years in the military, that those things are very, very important. So the answer to this question, I will make it to what I do now. I work in, for, w, for the WBDC, we are a nonprofit organization in downtown Chicago that focuses on ed, uh, entrepreneurial education for veterans and their family members. Um, one of the things that I didn't realize coming out of the military and what I now realize being in the space of veterans is because we've been, as military members, we've been in a systematic structure for so long, we're focused on serving, we're focused on doing, pay, you know, attention to detail, we're focused on, you know, the things that are put before us. And so when we separate from the military, the first things that we think about are, uh, I need housing, I need to make sure that my family is taken care of, or I need to make sure I have a job. I need to make sure that there's something that I can continue on with this structure that I've been taught for so many years. Um, and so what I, am able to do in the middle, in, in my current job is to introduce to veterans the option of taking those skills because it is sometimes difficult for veterans to transfer those skills that they learned in the military over into something that they can do as a job in the civilian world. It's very difficult for them to do that. A lot of companies now do have diversity goals um, in terms of veterans, hiring veterans and different things like that, but it's a constant ongoing struggle because it's difficult for them to um, locate those veterans who are able to even clearly translate what they've done in the military and how they can transfer that over into the into the civilian world and so what I've learned is that veterans don't have uh, that we don't think first entrepreneurship we don't think that you know take those skills that you had that you were taught in the military transfer them over into creating something for yourself um, transfer them over into um, creating a, a, a systematic dynamic that works well for your family. Um, we just naturally don't think that way because we're thinking of we need to survive once we get out of the military. I can personally say that once I got out of the military, I gave another 11 years to a government agency. Um, before I then gave another 11 plus years over to um, government, but more um, educational government. Um, and then decided to start a business, a, a, a company, um, educational services company. And I, and I often sit and think, well, what would have happened? Where would I have been? How much further have, had I have gone if I would have taken those skills and done that 22 years uh, pre giving that to somebody else? And so I don't think that as veterans, um, we think about that first. And so that's one of the things that I do. And I was having a conversation with the man, my manager at work, and 
I go out and I do a lot of workshops with veterans and it's very difficult to get veterans in those seats when I'm talking about entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and education and business development, different things like that. And she and I had a conversation and she said, I just don't understand why we're having a hard time getting the veterans in the seat when you have other organizations that have no problem. And I said, let me tell you why. I said, it's my, it, it would be my belief to think that, okay, if you, if, if you look at the, how, the, the people who are doing housing workshops, those workshops are satisfying a need. They're providing a resolution to a need that a veteran has. So you're gonna have 50 or 60 or 70 veterans in the room. Um, if you have something that's gonna provide them some other type of inf information on home, you know, um, education for their children or something like that, they're there because it's satisfying a need that they got met while they were in service. And so now that they're post-service, they're still looking for that need to be supplied. Well, entrepreneurship is not a need that they're looking to be supplied. So, you know, how do, the question is not how do we get them in the seat, the question is how do we provide for them in a way that's solving a need for them. And so that's kind of what I do um, in, in my role and how my attention to detail. I'm a bit OCD, I will admit to that, and that's probably partly due to my military experience. The other part is just my natural makeup, but when I was listening to uh, my Army colleague here next, next to me, I'm going to refer to you all night as my Army colleague. That's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, he, he brought, uh, he brought to my remembrance the fact that we do as army vet, as, You want to be though. <laughs> 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 I heard that. We, I heard that. Oh, he's trying to bring me on It's being recorded too, so I'm going to As veterans, <laughs> we, uh, we are, we do pay a lot of attention to detail, and so that's a part, that, that's an internal part of what I do on a daily basis as well. What's up? Well, there's been so much said here, I could depart, um, just echo a number of, of these things. Um, maybe I'll say a couple of concrete things and a couple of more abstract ones. Um, concretely, and especially as I think about you, so what has the military done for me? Is that the question? Or how I use it in my job, in my career? Mm -hmm. So concretely, um, the military sent me around the world a couple of different times. Um, I, I grew up in a place where people don't really go places, not very far. Um, and I've been to Europe, Southwest Asia, the Middle East, um, California, um, Arizona, Georgia, um, Washington, D.C., and a couple other places as a result of my experience in the military. So I just start there. Um, um, that kind of relates to diversity in a certain way. Um, I spent I spent ten months living with uh, a unit of um, primarily Pashtun but Afghan soldiers, um, day in and day out. It's difficult to explain exactly what that will do to and for you, um, um, but it will definitely force you to examine yourself. Um, it, it, you know, people sort of talk about diversity, um, but to me, it's it's maybe better to talk about about other people that you haven't met before and learning to meet people. Um, you will learn to meet people um, in ways that you never would have if you hadn't been in that experience. Um, the military gave me a series of skills. Uh, they call them MOS, as you heard this term, Military Occupational Specialties, um, which are mark. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, wait, what, you call it IS, right? No, it's our rate. Okay, ratings, right. So, um, military trains you to do a number of things. Um, those things turn out to be professionally marketable, whether it's in the larger government service or it's after. So, just sort of concrete things. Um, what, though, that relates to my job or to my life now? Maybe more profound stuff. Um, the military really taught me the limitations of power. Um, so I'm an officer. Uh, and in theory, that means that I have power. I, I write orders, I sign things, and supposedly things have to happen. Um, in theory, I sit at the top of a hierarchy, which is not really a hierarchy, it just looks like it. Um, and that means I'm in charge. Um, that's what every young, stupid officer thinks. You're not in charge. Um, 
what, what you learn really fast is that there's a difference between commanding people and inspiring them by understanding what motivates them. And that has shaped, well, let me back up. So again, we talk about leadership, and nobody says what that really means. I think leadership means cultivating in yourself the character and the competencies which allow you to um, inspire other people to do what, what they ought to do when you're not telling them to do it. Um, and so the task of leadership is first to listen to other human beings and, and to understand why they're where they are and what motivates them to be there. And then find the way that the goals that you have as an organization can serve the needs that they have as human beings. Because when that happens, that's when they become invested in the common project that you're about. Am I right? Am I something like that, right? So, so the military taught me that because it gave me first 28 people to care for and be concerned about, and then 100, and then a small unit, and now a bunch of college students. Uh, and in a lot of ways, <laughs> well, you know, I, I do, as a college professor, professor, what I learned to do in my first unit. I sit down and I meet every single one of my students, and I have 10 to 15 minutes of conversation with those students. Why do I do that? Because I want to manipulate. I mean, excuse me. Because I want to. Because <laughs> I want to understand where they are, right? Because it's very different to have a conversation, to attempt to do a common project with a group of people that knows you, and a group of people whom you know. Um, so, my experience of leadership has fundamentally shaped that side. It's taught me the limits of coercion of power. The other thing it did, right, is, is it's taught me the limitations of military power. Um, I think Americans, not to get all go all political, but I will. Um, I think Americans often have this, as a matter of policy, we tend to try to fix everything with the military, right? Like, um, if there's a problem overseas, if there's a problem, just you know, somehow call the Department of Defense and it will do anything, everything for you. If you have an issue, apply more combat power. Um, and one of the things I saw in Afghanistan and in other places is that. Um, Many problems in the world are human problems, and you can't fix everything by being bigger than people. Um, and oftentimes, your best efforts will lead to unforeseen second and what we call second and third order effects. Um, this is really important, actually. So sometimes you'll be told to go out there and change the world. And when you're told that, you'll assume that you both know um, the problem in the world and the means to fix it. Um, and it will turn out that you'll run out with all kinds of really good intentions and we will end up is realizing that you didn't understand the people that you needed to go serve in the first place and you didn't understand your role with respect to them. And so you had a bunch of things you thought were prescriptions for good which were actually just really doing damage to those people. Uh, and so um, what you need to be a good leader is humility. And it turns out that if you want to be a good leader, you need humility. And if you want to be a good teacher, you need humility. And if you want to be a successful business person, you need humility. So. Um, it's the most abstract, but also the most profound lessons that I think remain, um, and that continue for me in, in a big way. Um, it also just forced me to be around people that I never would have been around growing up in, in Carson City, Michigan, right? Or not in Michigan, Michigan. Um, so your your soldiers, um, sailors, airmen, and marines, um, come from just a huge cross-section of the country, uh, oftentimes from uh, lower economic demographics than um, the population in general. Um, and, and that's a good thing, um, because you're forced to see other people and learn them and care for them. And they learn to care for you, uh, and that remains. So I'll stop. You know, people on for a long time. Yeah, so we're, we're going to zoom in, and then we're going to zoom back out. So just some specific things that I'd like to hear about from you all one at a time. So, uh, Mike, part of your work is kind of thinking about this theme of job readiness. Um, I'd like for you to talk maybe a little bit about what it means to make a veteran job ready, um, what that looks like, how you can kind of tell when you're succeeding at that work, and why that's important. Okay. We have, <clears throat> my organization mainly does what's called a Veterans Employment Transition Seminar. And she hit a little bit on um, the transition piece. And mainly what that means is service members, when they get ready to come out of the military or maybe they've been out of the military for 20, 30, 40 years, 
it helps them transition or reword their military experiences into civilian terminology to where if I'm talking to a civilian that's never been in the military, I can tell them, I can tell them and they understand what I did in the military, how my experiences can bring them to a potential employer where I could be a good employee with an organization. And that goes all the way down to identifying the skills that you have that they're looking for. It goes down to, we do exercises that determine what are you really passionate about? You may think I want to be a teacher, but then you do a couple of exercises and teacher's not anywhere near the top. You might be, you want to do something, you may, somebody with your hands, maybe you want to be a dental hygienist, or maybe you want to do, maybe be a doctor or something like that. That's something that you're passionate about. So you maybe you want to pursue that career. So we take all those th different things and we start to build a resume in civilian, in civilian language. Taking again all your military experiences, put those on a resume. It goes into networking. I turned almost 28 years in the military. I got out when I was 46, 47 years old. I didn't know what networking meant. The military gave me people to network with. The people that I served alongside of, they gave them to me. So when I got out of my first civilian job, where I was working as a government contractor and family assistance, I had to go out and meet, learn how to meet people. I was a shy person growing up in school. I was not the kind of guy that would go up and think, ooh, she's pretty, I like going on a date. I wouldn't go ask her on a date, because I was scared of rejection. I was scared I'd get turned down. And I'm still sort of that way today, but I'm working through that piece, because I have to learn how to network. I have to go out and meet people. I have to go out and meet employers that want to hire veterans and military families. So that's a barrier that I have to overcome and I'm working on it every day. Um, another thing that we do is we talk about the networking piece. We talk about research. You may want to go work at Lowe's, but if you do the research on Lowe's and maybe you identify what your values are, what really makes you click inside, maybe Lowe's doesn't have those values, so maybe you might not be a good fit for that company to work with. You may want to go work at Home Depot or some other place like that. And then we get into the mock interviewing piece and we, and we teach veterans on how to tell their story in civilian terms in an interview, okay? That's what we do. And then we do hiring fair, and at the end, we have a, a graduation hiring fair at the end. We bring in part employers that want to hire veterans. You know, so that's also helps me on the, on the networking piece and able to talk about myself to where, when I can talk about my experiences, what I could bring to an employer from my military experience. Jason, I'd love to hear a little bit about the fact that, you know, you've kind of had your military career and your academic career kind of operating parallel to one another. Um, so how would you say that the time you spent in the armed forces has impacted your career in academia? That's a really, hello? That's a really big, um, difficult question. Um, again, I'll say some concrete things and then some more abstract ones. Um, so the, the military experience um, helped me pay for um, rent through graduate school. That's just important. We talk about impact. I, did, I had six years of graduate school. I had uh, a wife and family. And it added an extra, I think, six or seven hundred dollars a month after my service that, that was big help. So in that way, there's a financial reality in this thing. Um, It has given me professional uh, training and formation that I never would have had if I had only been studying. So um, working in an office, working in a bureaucracy, um, understanding the way budgets work, uh, the way that different perspectives within an organization shape perceptions of what's possible. So um, you know, when you're at the bottom of something, you think, how come everybody doesn't see what I'm going through? And then you get higher up in the thing and you go, man, how come everybody doesn't see what I'm going through? <laughs> and you realize that, that organizations have big complex problems um, and each position at the table can, can affect the way that problem is attacked. I, I think it's really important in the university setting, actually, because everyone's working from perspective with constraint, with a restraint. Um, so it really just gave me a professional formation that, that um, I never would have had if I had spent all my time in a library, um, and only that. Um, it also it has shaped the, the kinds of questions and things I'm concerned with. So I, I work in, um, in history and in theology, um, 
and that experience in a lot of ways has made me much more, it made me think about suffering. Um, both my time, my own experience as a soldier, but also my experience seeing populations which I would say have been just suffering for, for maybe centuries, um, will ask you, force you to ask fundamental questions about yourself and the world that you wouldn't have asked otherwise. Um, um, yeah, so, so I mean, I, I could go into like the way to shape my research questions or theological questions, um, but I'd say that along the way, the fact that I was in the military constantly put me in into situations that, that forced me to think back again about my research and vice versa. Um, I'm trying to pull one out that wouldn't be really too too much or embarrassing to a person who or something, but. Um, just even forcing you outside of a library into um, the experience of a community of people that, that, that have difficulty in ways that you may not have difficulty in a library um, <laughs> uh, will, will shape everything you're thinking about all the way, all the way through, you know? Um, so, and I'm, I'm maybe more sympathetic when people get DUIs. Like, it seems funny to say, right? But you know, you get you get people who have have DUIs or struggle with addiction or struggle with something, and it's easy to step back and go, oh well, should have done that, right? Those are the rules, and that's why you broke the rules. But after a while, you come to see that people are caught in complex situations um, over which they have partial control but not complete. Um, that on the one hand they're responsible for their actions, on the other hand their actions are shaped by their condition, and you, you know you, you just you become more nuanced if you're paying attention. Uh, so I'll stop there again. I hope that was a good answer. Uh, so Miyosha and Makiba, you're both serving women veterans in really specific, important ways. What do you see as some of the ways that serving the female population of veterans differs from the ways that male veterans are served? And what are some of the things that you find kind of most critical in helping female veterans kind of transition back um, into civilian life? And is transition even kind of the primary goal? So I always say that the military is a reflection of society. So I am going to get a little political. Uh, women are still not treated equally in the civilian world. So why would you think they would be treated equally in the military or once they get out? So I was never the veteran. When I walked into veteran places, I was always looking for a veteran. What veteran are you looking for? Are you the sister? Are you the wife? Are you the girlfriend of the veteran? Even when I'm like with a male, um, even my VA letters come to the house says Mr. Neosha Thomas. Um, I just uh, can't be a veteran. Um, and so that's the mindset, right? And unfortunately, mindset dictates and sort of shapes policy. So I'm from Chicago. So in Illinois, we have tons of housing. So women veterans are currently the highest growing population of homeless veterans. That is a fact, Google it. In Illinois, there are about six housing, homeless veteran housing, all male, none for women. Um, the, the way the VA is shaped, um, when, I, when I first went to the VA, I got six marriage proposals. Put my hair to that. <laughs> um, but just to try to get to my appointment, um, the, the type of sexual harassment you got to go to, through to get to a medical appointment is very jarring um, to the point where you don't want to come back. And unfortunately, if women veterans don't show up, that's an excuse to cut funding, what little there is. Um, and I realized I wasn't the only female veteran going through these things. Um, and so my mother always said, if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So I got tired of writing my letters and complaining um, about the treatment of women veterans, or when you go to a homeless veteran stand down, they give women 
male underwear, male deodorant, things for male. Now, true, the military is a male-dominated uh, military, but it's not a male-only military. Um, and a lot of things that, even while you're in the military, the way the ships are set up, the bathrooms, it's just women must have never served, even though women historically have been in wars since the beginning of time. We weren't just the causes of war sometimes. We were fighting. We were spies, you know? So it's like, come on, people. Like, we're, we're here. We're, we're serving, and we're, we're tired. We're tired of having to say that just because I'm a different gender. Um, and so I fought back by starting this organization. And I started with, what do I want to see? What was my transition like? What were the problems I had? And I started from there to create it. If anything, the military taught me that I, my biggest takeaway is that to be flexible and that it's going to be OK. Um, every path I took, <laughs> I got four degrees and I'm working on fifth. Um, I have an IT degree, I have an education degree, I was college valedictorian. Ask me, I'm an artist. I like to do art now. You know, so to, to try it, to no matter where you go, because we travel to all these different places, um, no matter where you go, you're going to be okay. You can change your mind, but everything leads you back to the same path. Um, I actually found that I operate in three lanes either education, veterans, and art. Those are the three things that make me happy. And if I operate within those lanes, I am happy. And I started to wonder, where were the other female veterans? And were they going through similar issues? Were they having the struggles that I was having? And I'm like, yes. Something as simple as, I remember my first event. I'm like, you know, we're women veterans, but we're women first, right? What do women like? So let me go throw a fashion show. Let me do a sip and paint party. You know, let me do some fun things. And I did a tea party, and 150 women veterans showed up. But the narrative is that women veterans don't show up. So then places started to ask the question, well, why are you getting so many women veterans and we're not? I'm like, one, just like any woman, when you constantly ignore her, and don't appreciate her. She's going to leave, but she's not going to show up, and she's not going to trust coming back to you. All I'm doing is being attentive and listening to a woman and giving a woman what she wants. That's women, period. Guys out there, that's the, <laughs> if you're wondering, do those things, and she's good. That's the secret. Pass it, share it. Please. Right. <laughs> like, please. But the powers that be were not understanding that. And then women, when, if you're constantly not believed to be a veteran, why am I going to admit I'm a veteran? Why I'm, when they say, where are the veterans, why am I going to raise my hand? Why am I going to do that? So it just started with recognizing that women veterans were here. I was doing this work. Now women veterans are trending, as I said. When I started, we weren't. Then I was helping Wounded Warrior Project, and Mission Continues write policies for women veterans. Um, like we just got here. Um, so until society, i.e. the civilian world, changes its views towards women and really, really honestly sees them as equal partners, capable leaders, and things like that in the civilian world. Like, why are we so excited that, you know, the even with the elections, look at all the women that have taken office. We're like, yeah. Well, this is 2018. Like, why are we so excited about that? Because honestly, it doesn't happen. And there's a problem with that. And it literally echoes through the military, and then it echoes through the veteran community when we come home. So until one policy changes here in the civilian world, it won't ripple through the rest of the chain. And women, we have to continue to tell our story. We have to own our voice, own our story, not be ashamed of it. I used to lie about my story because people wanted a soldier. I didn't look like, when you turn on the television, you see white male army, right? I'm black woman, maybe. I already don't fit the equation. So I, I would, it was the pressure, you 
you know, my story wasn't good enough because I didn't look like that equation. But damn it, I did the work. You know, so, and you have to say that. You have to stand up as women in this world, in your positions, in your class, you own your story. Your story is a part of who you are. It was meant to happen as it happened because everything that happens is meant to develop you into who you are supposed to be. Every experience is going to shape you. You need those experiences, good, bad, and different, to tell your story, to share your voice. Like, you know what? I'm going to take this skill from this situation and use it towards the next. But we have to own our stories. We have to voice our story. We can't wait for people to ask. You can't wait for people to ask. Don't sit in class like, oh, I know the answer, but I'm not going to say it. No, excuse me. You know, you have to, you have to speak up because we can't wait. Time is up. It's been up. Okay. Um, so part of that, to answer your question, is one, society needs to change its views towards women, period. And then that will ripple through. And then on the opposite side of that, women, women veterans included, need to share their voice and own their story. And those two things together will evoke change. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> Now, I will add, uh, so it's, it's very interesting um, that she mentioned about uh, why in 2018 we're still like, I am woman, here we roar, and we're like really pumping up the um, achievements of women so much. It's, it's mind boggling, you know, that we are in 2018 and we're still doing that. I just made a social media post today highlighting the fact that there were. Uh, I don't want to say the wrong number, but there's a double digit number of African American women judges who all uh, won the election in their respective places um, to be judges. Well, there was a social media post made about that, and, and the, it's so ironic that she said this, but the first thought that ran through my mind was to post, it's so sad that we are actually so excited about making this post. When in actuality, it just should be natural. I mean, because you're not going to see a post with a whole bunch of men saying, wow, we just had 25 men judges, because it's something that happens on a regular occurrence, right? So to the point of what, Moish, just Miosha. Miosha. To the point of what she said, um, there is a change and a shift in the mindset. And unfortunately, I'm not quite sure that we're ever going to see that in our lifetime when it comes to women. So when we look at the WBDC, the organization that I work for, the organization was started 32 years ago. And it was started by two women activists. And um, it was started because, primarily because, they recognized that the equality of pay, the equality of being able to get business loans, the equality of being able to position yourself as a woman to uh, create a business or to create a presence for yourself in the entrepreneurial world was not equal to men. That glass ceiling was there. And they would never be able to have what was afforded to the male counterparts. So the WBDC, Women's Business Development Center, was created under that, that um, umbrella. 30-some-odd uh, years later, we don't just service women. We service men as well. So we have a good number of our clients who are men. Um, but the, the organization still advocates for the rights of women equality. Um, and it's something that's going to be in advocacy as long as probably we all exist because the truth of the matter is it's not going to be equal. When we talk about women veterans, and I was just at an event today where this was highlighted, um, one of the major issues when women come out of the military is when you look in the military, there was equality um, in terms of pay. You know, so I'm a woman in the military. I'm here with my counterpart in the military. We both are the same rank. We both do the same job. We both get paid the same, right? However, when the woman leaves the military, she has to now wrap her head around the fact that there is no equality, which in and of itself is a difficult thing to um, embrace. You know, so now she's getting paid 30% less than her male counterpart for doing the same job. And she has to, okay, so now, homeless women veterans is now increasing because there is this huge shift in how am I going to make a living? 
Um, I can't look at entrepreneurship as an option because I got to figure out how to survive. You know, now that I'm out, because that covering that the military provided me, um, and, and what you have to understand, and what a lot of, and this is this is the degree of separation that is so far yet so so close with military and civilian is the military is literally a world of its own. Like you go on a military base and it is literally its own city. Like that's, that's how we function. And so to come out of that and to, uh, I think when the panel was talking earlier, we're talking, I think it was me, she was talking about integration. Integration, um, and instead of using the word integration, we're using the word merging. Um, because it's hard to integrate a mindset with a new mindset. It's very difficult to cause that integration, right? So what you do is you take a mindset and you merge it in with a new mindset and try to figure out how to function within that. But what has happened is in civilian world, there is no merging. There's a separation, there's this divide, and now we are tasked with trying to make things easier for the veteran. Or we're trying to make why are we trying to make it easier for the veteran? Why are we trying to make it easier for the woman? We're all people. So can I have the same opportunities as a woman veteran if we need to put that stigma, if we need to put that title on there? Why do I need to, can I just have things that are normal, normally uh, provided for the civilian woman? So I've been to these events where there are, it's a veteran event and there are, um, like you know, Yosha said, we are, we are highly, my, my, um, my, my colleague here, um, we, where the males are, are highly represented there, and we have these panels, and the panels have, uh, we're talking about women, we're talking about um, how women veterans um, are represented, but there's no representation of them. So we have these events where there's a very low representation of women veterans, and then when we talk about women veterans, we are, um, we're, we're putting them in the box of military spouses. Um, so now you don't even want to recognize that military women veterans even exist. But again, I go back to the first question is why does it even have to be that divide? So it's, it's you know, exactly what she just said. There has to be a change of mindset in the civilian world. Um, I can understand, I do understand the, pre the precedent of trying to create an environment that's, um, that's better or somewhat equal for the military veteran because some people do understand that there is a difficult transition. I get it. Um, but if you're going to do that, you have to approach it with the same opportunities that you would for the civilian person. You just have to. Um, so, you know, being in my space, being in what I do on a daily basis, I've just been so, um, it, there's both an intrigue and then there's a fuel that, that is underneath me just trying to educate and provide opportunities for the women veterans because if I don't do it, who is? Who will provide them, you know, who will help them to understand that, you know, you are a, a single mother or you are a military spouse now, because now you've gone from being a woman, a woman, woman veteran to being, the, if you have a husband who's still in the service, now you are a woman veteran who's transitioned to military spouse, and that's just a whole lot more stuff. <laughs> you know, so it's a lot of different nuances, a lot of different things to consider, but Unfortunately, I don't think that the equality factor will ever be reached, um, but we need to really try to do a great job in, in making it um, as closely, you know, as closely knit as possible. So I have one more kind of closing question for the panel, and then if you all have any questions, we have a little bit of time for that. But just as kind of a way of um, letting the audience leave with some sense of kind of call to action or call to kind of educate themselves differently, um, if you could think of one thing, like a stigma, a mischaracterization, or misconception in the ways that kind of society thinks about veterans and people who serve, that you would want people to kind of check or um, look more deeply to kind of better understand it, if you could name just one thing, um, what might that be? I think most people who I meet, when they find out that I'm a veteran, think that they need to make some statement or act that lets me know that in some way they know I'm better than they are. What do I mean by that? I say I'm a veteran, you say, oh, thank you for your service, and I really, like, like there's this act of 
of somehow paying me something that they owe me or that I've done that they haven't done. This is, this is counterintuitive. I can see the faces out there going, what? Wait? No, I really mean this. Um, it, it's unintentional, but one of the things that can happen is that sort of act ends up um, putting this separation between me as a veteran and you as a citizen. Um, that's why I use that term better than the era, because it's, because it, it's striking. But I, I kind of mean that. It's so people believe that they have to say, oh, well, since you are in the military and you've been somewhere, I have to, you know, do pay some obligatory honor that maybe or maybe I, I may or may not agree with or think or whatnot. So I, I can't talk to you about my sincere thoughts about the military, or I can't, I can't relate to you because apparently you've done something that's so different than me. Um, I think that's a stereotype that is damaging both to the military and to the city. Um, I would encourage that um, if you haven't, if you have, if, if you are a citizen and you haven't ever thought about serving, um, think about it on the one hand. But on the other hand, also know that many of the things you do are just as, as necessary and good for the general health of our community of, of, of citizens as also the things that I do. And so rather than, than, than some stereotype thing, maybe ask, what did you do? Or what do you do? Or simply affirm it. Um, or let it go like other things, too, rather than say something that puts a separation who I am as a person who served and, and who you are. Um, um, I also want to say, um, remember the people who were in Vietnam. Um, I was in Afghanistan. I was in nasty places in Afghanistan. But when I meet people who are in Vietnam, I stop and say, thank you for the suffering. Um, uh, the women and men who served in Vietnam were in maybe one of the last, hopefully the last great, what I would call shooting war. Um, and when they came home, they, um, they were proactively disrespected very often, which is made worse by the fact that they were drafted. They didn't get to choose out. Um, and when you get to know Vietnam veterans, um, you know some people who are acquainted with grief in ways that I just think very few people in our society have been. So um, I want to use my position as a veteran to say, no, no, thank them. You see that, that person walking around with a private Vietnam whatever, stop and say, I know that what you did was a great sacrifice. Um, and I honor them. Absolutely agree. No, thank you for your services. Um, I think we went from one extreme to the other. Uh, we went from the disrespecting our Vietnam vets to over respecting <laughs> the vets uh, nowadays. And I appreciate all the free meals I'm going to get on Veterans Day. Don't get me wrong. You see the theme here? Right. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> It's going to be the best. Aye, aye, aye. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but um, I feel like we went um, from one extreme to the other, and we need to find a balance, and that's to bridge the gap between civilians and military. Um, but the biggest thing for me is that when people think of deployment and sacrifice, you only think of Iraq and Afghanistan. If veterans do not go to Iraq and Afghanistan, it's not the same type of sacrifice in your eyes because they've seen combat. Um, I was sharing earlier when it's by definition, it's just you're, you're leaving, like you're, you're leaving your port, your, your command, and going to a different place temporarily. Um, so if you have a family, anytime you deploy, not just Iraq and Afghanistan, you're leaving behind your family, which doesn't hurt any more or any less if you're in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
The first time I deployed, my daughter, who's now 16, was uh, three months old. I came back, she was a year and didn't know who I was. As a mother, imagine your child doesn't know who you was, but that doesn't matter as much because I didn't go to Iraq or Afghanistan. Or because when I was injured and they wanted to amputate my leg or I couldn't walk for a year, that, or I have continuous blood clots and I could die any moment from a pulmonary embolism according to my doctors, that doesn't matter because it didn't happen in Iraq or, or Afghanistan. What does that do to me? So already, I'm a woman veteran, right? And it's, it's a whole bunch of issues with that. I'm a disabled veteran that was retired. So mind you, it takes at least 20 years to retire. I only did 10. My injuries were so bad, they retired me as if I did 20. But that doesn't matter in your eyes because I didn't go to Iraq or Afghanistan. So to, you put certain veterans on this pedestal. So even if a veteran went to Iraq and Afghanistan, no injuries or nothing, that veteran is better than me, who walks with a cane, but I don't wear them all the time because they don't match my outfits. <laughs> um, you know, so it's, it's like, it's not this better or worse. If you serve, no matter how, whether she did four years, whether I did 10 years, whether he did 27, 30 years. Mm -hmm. We all served and we, were, we all volunteered to serve and we all knew the risk and were willing to accept the risk, whether it was a patriotic choice, it was a choice for college money, it, it doesn't matter. Like I said I was willing to die. Now, you don't think you will. <laughs> you signed up. Like, not for real. For like, like, for real. Because <laughs> it's, it's so funny. We just, so, I remember when September 11th happened. Mind you, I'm like 18. I'm in Italy. Like, I was heading out to the club, but I had duty first. So I had to download the top secret message traffic. And people were watching the television, and it's the weekend. And normally on the weekend, you could watch movies. So I'm watching people jump out of buildings and buildings crashing. I thought it was a movie. I literally was like, what movie are you guys watching? And the officer was like, it's not a movie. We're going to war. As Soon as he said that, alarms went off. I'm stuck on base because I'm essential personnel because I am intelligence. Mind you, like on the ship, when the captain goes down with the ship, you heard of that? That's not true. The captain is the first one off the ship with a speedboat and rescue divers. Who goes down with the ship? Me. Because I'm intelligence and we have to make sure everything is destroyed. So while everybody else is escaping, we're sinking, trying to destroy stuff. But, you know, the captains get the glory and things like that. So, I mean, it's so many all veterans who serve. Honorable dishonorable, general, one day, 30 years. When they signed up, they made a conscious choice that they were willing to sacrifice their lives. That should be honored. So I will just add to this, um, there's this misnomer that um, you know, disabled veterans um, should be, um, there should be a mindset of special, special attention. So this kind of just goes with everything that's already been previously said. Um, please don't automatically assume that because a person served in the military that they are just crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean that. Everybody got it. I mean, you know, the postal, the, po the whole postal man, right. you know, I used to work for the post office too. Um, so, you know, you work for the post office, oh, don't go postal. You know, that little whole colloquialism that's just like not necessary. Um, but what I found since um, so I'm currently going through the process of um, VA claims and, and all of that, which is an entirely different process of just unnecessary, um, you know, behavior from that side. So we're already dealing with the um, having to deal with what we have to deal with from the military side or the, or the VA side. And then we have the individuals that see us on a regular basis and, and 
now there is, oh, they have PTSD, oh, we gotta be careful. PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. That means you have just come across or been involved with anything that's stressful. We all got PTSD if you really think about it. Um, so, but when it's attached to a veteran, we got problems take cover because they're gonna blow in a minute. Such a, um, just an assumption that's not true. Um, so if there's one thing that I can just ask of, of anyone who listens is, um, you know, disabled doesn't always look like disabled. You know what I mean? Uh, they may not be having a cane. They may not be walking with, you know, but don't, so don't assume that number one, a person is okay, but then don't take that to the extreme and say, well, they're not okay, so they're really crazy. Mm -hmm. And so we have to walk on the eggshells around them, and we can't have them in our workplace. And if they are in our workplace, then we have to make sure we keep our eye on them because, you know, they can blow at any time. And we're pe and that's the divide. The, a lot of that type of activity and that, those types of thought processes are what contributes to the divide. Um, that has been fueled a lot by media. It has been fueled a lot by assumptions and presumptions and all that stuff. Um, it's just simply not true. Uh, when we see someone going through something, they just choose to look at them through the eyes of just humankind. Um, just because I'm a veteran doesn't mean that when I go through something that you've gone through, it's that much worse. It's the same experience. I'm just a veteran. Okay, so uh, that would probably be the one thing that I would place a lot of emphasis on that a lot of our veterans are going through and dealing with um, the largest number of homelessness is represented by veterans when you look at it from a general standpoint and, and we, we, we can't have that. We can't look at that. You know, we have, we have to change the way that our perceptions are. Um, so that would be the one thing. Can you repeat the question? Just make sure I answer it right. <laughs> if there is a stigma, a misconception, um, something that you would want people to either kind of check or get more information on in terms of how they think about veterans. Experiences happen to me a lot. Um, I'm a service-connected disabled veteran. Okay. For those of you who know that means I have issues or things that are wrong with me, both internal and external, while I served in the military. So that's what that's called. So therefore, I have a handicap license plate that is gold, you know. And there are times where, depending on how I feel, you see me fidget, I have problems with my back. So there's times on how I feel if, if I choose to park in a handicap spot in a parking lot, or if I go choose to park in a spot way out there where I can walk. And I've had people yes. yell out the window and say, well, you don't look disabled, where are you parking? And I'm walking just like anybody else is. You know, I've almost gotten into a fight one day over that piece. And so that's one thing that it happens to me, and I've seen it happen to other people, that it's all a misconception on how you look. There are still things wrong with veterans, okay? So just kind of keep, kind of what she said, just kind of keep that in mind. You know, if, if that applies to you, take it for what it's worth. If you see somebody else do that, try to talk to them about it in a reasonable way, not into a fighting moment. In a, in, a, in a sensible way. Um, so I know that some of you might have questions. I also know that we are slightly over time. And so I would like, if you do have questions, maybe you can come up and approach the panels individually. Um, in the meantime, thank you all so much for your time and for your attention. And join me in just one more round of applause for our panelists.